Hi there. In this lecture, we're going to be looking at uh, the introduction to the sociological approach and some of the key concepts associated with studying sociology that you guys need to get your heads around so confidently navigate your way through the rest of this A-level course. Um, hopefully, by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to look at these two images on the right and you'll be able to explain how they actually represent, represent the discipline of sociology. So we'll be coming back to these shortly. So the concepts we're going to focus on are looking at a, a clear definition of society, social factors, what culture actually is, norms and values. So you should be able to write in those definitions as we go through the rest of this lecture. So when we think about sociology, sometimes people ask what exactly is it that sociologists do? Effectively, they study the behaviour of people who live together in a loose community with loose connections. This is what we call society. Now, obviously, within that community, there are sort of groups that have much tighter connections, like you have a much closer bond with your family and your friends. But other than that, you know, we are very much loosely connected to people who live down the road, people who live up in Newcastle. We're all kind of in the same community or a society. So when we think about the behaviour sociologists want to study, they are interested in how behaviour is influenced by society. Okay, so how what we do is influenced by society, the things around us. But they're also more interested in how actually what we do can affect the society around us, like how we can create change, or we can affect others, or how we can impact on institutions. So, like I said, there are two different perspectives. Um, can society influence your behaviour? So what can you think of an example of society can influence your behaviour? A bit like the puppet image you've got there. Uh, think about friends, media, celebrities, family. Uh, and I think a more complicated question is how might your behaviour, our behaviour, actually influence the social world around us? So what sorts of things can we do to influence social society and the social world around us and the people around us? If you never think about those two questions and annotate on your notes, that'd be great. So why actually study society? Well, mainly because sociologists want to gain a deeper understanding of the world we live in. Uh, generally, sociologists are looking for what we call social causes for behaviour. Um, we very rarely look at an individual doing something by themselves and think, wow, that individual is doing that because of their own motivations. We tend to look for social reasons for behaviour which can kind of help us understand how society works, and society is a huge, complex thing, so how on earth does it work? But most importantly, it can also help us understand uh, when it doesn't work. So, for example, high levels of crime, um, you know, increased levels of divorce would arguably be evidence of society possibly not working. And that's where sociology can have a real impact. We can try and explain why it's not working and hopefully help people come up with solutions in what we call social policy. So... Uh, what aspects of society do you think would be interesting to study? Have a think about it, Google it if you need to. But what aspects of society do you think would be interesting to study as a sociologist? And believe me, you can pretty much study anything. I've done a course uh, that uh, mentioned the sociology of tomatoes and toasters, I think, in the, same, in the same book. So there are many aspects of society you can study. So have a think. So what's different about sociology? Some of you might be studying psychology, history, for example. So how are we actually different? Well, like I said before, we don't really see individuals as behaving in an individual's way. They kind of look at what we call social factors and how they might affect people's behaviour. Uh, so some of the social factors that we all have and can actually affect our behaviour, our beliefs, our views, our values, include age, gender, ethnicity, social class, time period, so where in time you are, and the type of society you live in. Uh, just to be really clear with ethnicity, that's different to race, okay? So race is about skin colour, it's like a biological element. Ethnicity is very much about your sort of culture, your, for example, maybe your religion, your beliefs and your values. Uh, like I said, social factors can influence how you act and think. So let's have a quick look at some of these and I can give you some examples that you can annotate on your notes. For example, age. Okay, age is something, uh, is a social factor, and it can affect our behaviour. So there are certain types of behaviour that are associated with certain ages that's considered normal. So for example, if you're a toddler, it's perfectly normal to maybe play in the swings and go down a slide. What's less normal is when you see maybe a couple of old people playing on the swings. If you saw a couple of old people playing on the swings, you might not go, oh god, that's weird, but you might go, oh, that's sweet, that's really unusual, don't often see that. That's because age is a social factor that, to an extent, will control what you do, what you think, what you feel. 
Likewise, gender. Now, this is something we are going to be looking at quite a lot this year. Gender, for example, is a social factor that can influence what you wear. Uh, we have ideas in our heads about what's normal for boys to wear, what for girls to wear. And likewise, as a result, when we look at people who have got transgendered identities, whether it's transsexual, transvestite, transgender, that can sometimes seem unusual because we are socialised, we are taught to expect boys and girls to have very separate identities in terms of what they wear, makeup, behaviour, hairstyles, all of those kind of very visual things. Now, gender isn't just about what you wear. Gender is also about the leisure activities you do and what's normal and what's considered abnormal. So gender is actually a really significant social factor that has a huge amount of influence on the choices you make on a daily basis, if you look at society in that way. Ethnicity is a significant social factor in our society. We are now a multicultural society in terms of the UK, uh, and that's linked to things like globalisation. Um, but it really can influence uh, you in many different ways. So I've given the example here of actually ethnicity can influence what leisure activities you end up choosing. And that might be because certain ethnic groups might see certain leisure activities as more normal. It could be because their parents are associated with that activity, so they sort of teach their children to do them. Or certain ethnic groups might value certain hobbies in different ways. So, for example, I've, I've given a few interests here, and I really have stereotyped basketball, really popular among Afro-Caribbeans, okay, particularly in American culture. Uh, cricket, enormously popular with Indians and Pakistanis. And skiing, um, interesting enough, if any of you go skiing, it's a very white sport, okay, it's dominated by the white ethnic group. And although, however, I would argue that's possibly linked to things like money and cost and what have you. And likewise, certain ethnicities turn to value certain musical instruments. So you're quite a lot more likely to see maybe Asian students perhaps playing classical instruments. And that's maybe linked to things about that their family possibly value as well. The type of society that you end up living in um, can have a huge impact on you as a person and your, and your identity and the type of life you have. Um, so I've picked on a, 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 I've narrowed it down to one aspect of, um, I guess, your experiences, and that's of childhood. Depending on the society you grow up in, you will have a very different childhood. Um, different societies have different definitions of childhood and different expectations of what children should get up to. So I've um, picked out a couple of images here, and I'm sure you can see what's going on. Your typical white Western experience of childhood is down the bottom right, um, and that's what I expect any child to be doing, playing with toys. Um, you've got images from the developing world on the rest of the slide. So I've got one there from India. You've got those girls sitting in the street. They're clearly working. They're not in school. They're not playing. Again, in India, that's con considered normal for many children to work, not go to school. And on the right-hand side there, I've got an image of a child soldier. And in er many areas of the world um, where it's very unstable, school is not considered the normal pastime for young people and actually engaging in conflict and uh, is definitely something that's considered, I wouldn't say normal, but certainly uh, more likely than perhaps the rest of the world. Most famously, you get child soldiers in like sub-Saharan Africa. However, these ones, um, I think, are from Malaysia, okay, northern Malaysia, when there's been some civil war between the sort of the Muslim and the Buddhist population there. The final fact I want to talk to you about today is social class. And arguably, this is one of the most powerful social factors that will influence you and the people around you throughout the rest of your life, even if you don't realise it. So social class effectively boils down to how much money you have um, and your social class is probably more likely to be determined by your family at the moment. Um, so have a think about social class. I've got an image there, very stereotypical, of a, of a working class family, um, a working class home. It looks like it's in a council estate. You can tell that the, you know, the conditions don't look too good. And it seems to be what we call a lone parent family, much more common within the working class, for example. On the right-hand side there, I've got the Hilton family. You couldn't get much further away. Um, they clearly live more than a middle class lifestyle. They live what I'd call an upper class lifestyle. But the biggest class in society is the middle class. So small, upper class is quite small. But have a think, and can you annotate on your empowerment point, how do you think living in a working class family would have an impact on your family compared to an upper class family? Think about maybe education, health, housing, friends, holidays. How can your class affect how you live your life? So as well as thinking about social factors, sociology is a very interesting in culture. Culture is something that can influence us on a day-to-day -day basis and we are going to be studying culture and identity this year. 
So people live in social groups, like I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. Your family, your school, work, maybe even religious group, as well as more loosely the community around them. Now, all of these groups serve a key purpose, okay, whether it's for um, economic provision, education, uh, a sense of hope and peace. But as well as all those things, they actually give us a sense of belonging. Being members of groups allows us to feel a sense of belonging to the world around us, which is really important because no one wants to feel lonely. We are really affected by these groups and we develop strong relationships with the people within them. And, in turn, we affect others within these groups. This is known as interaction, how we interact with other people. What I'm interested in is how culture, our shared culture effectively, allows us all to interact with each other, even if we've never met them before. So what is it about our culture that allows us to get on with, I don't know, a complete stranger that you might be stood next to waiting to get into the cinema? What is it that allows us to interact with each other about our culture? So, when we think about what actually is culture, here's a definition for you to annotate. Culture is the shared meanings, values, customs and norms of a society or group. Clearly, culture varies where you are in the world. In the UK, we have a specific culture. It's different to American culture. It's different to some of the tribal cultures experienced around Africa, for example. But culture is quite a significant factor that can shape our behaviour, ideas and beliefs in society. One of the key aspects of culture is this notion of shared values. And I mentioned earlier on, values is one of the concepts that we're going to be looking at. Values are ideas and beliefs that people have about what is worth striving for, but things that are really important. So when I was thinking about what are the things that people in our society regard as important, um, I would argue things like family is generally a shared uh, uh, value. We all think it's important. People generally value education, educational success, you know, to, in order to get jobs. We value our privacy. And there are bigger values like democracy, representation, freedom of speech. But we also value our safety. So how is it that we know that these things are generally valuable to most people in the UK? Mm. Have a think about what you notice around you in the world, what structures are in place, what laws, what rules, that seem to suggest that these things are pretty important to most of the people that we deal interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. One of the things we're thinking about is to what extent are these values shared? And I guess this is a little bit of evaluation. Um, have a think about what you value. Write down a list. Ask, and then what I'd like you to do is ask your friends and family sometime over the summer or whenever, what is it that they value? And figure out if they say similar things. Um, and it's worth thinking about. Do you think the social factors that I went through earlier on, like age, class, gender, ethnicity, do you think those social factors might shape value? So, for example, if you ask older people, do they value slightly different things compared to what you value? And why is that? Why, why are your ideas about what's important slightly different? One of the things that's worth mentioning about values is they are not what we call universal. They are not the same all over the world. And they can also change over time. So, for example, can you think of a culture that has slightly different values? Maybe you've been on holiday or you just have seen it on TV, where you can clearly see a culture that has a very different value set. Or not even very different, just slightly different value uh, values. So, for I'll give you a quick example. I know that uh, within... Uh, Chinese culture, family is enormously important, okay? It's quite normal if an elderly relative gets ill that they move in with the family. That's part of their cultural value for family and their respect for their elders. And we don't necessarily have that value in this country. So have a think if you can think of any other ones. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that every single group has values. So when we might see, you know, yobs, for example, on the street drinking, People might say, oh, they've got no values, okay? But they don't. They've just got simply different values to us. So for them, they might value the status they gain from their peers from dressing in a particular way. They might value looking hard by maybe swearing quite loudly in public. And they might value the thrill of getting drunk during the day, for example. Likewise, um, when you look at um, in history, like the Ku Klux Klan, there's an image there of the Ku Klux Klan, the, pe the reason people behave like that within the KKK was because they valued white supremacy. Now, that might seem abhorrent to many of us, but that's why they behaved that way, because their values were different. So, once we've got an idea about the things that are important, or values, 
we then need to come up with some norms. Now, norms are what we call social expectations or rules about what people should or should not do, how they should or should not behave. What is generally considered normal? Most norms aren't laws, they're just social expectations. However, some norms are laws, okay? So there are some things that are important enough to be enshrined in law. So have a quick think about what are the everyday rules or expectations about waiting for a bus? So think about what you do when you wait for a bus. When you get on the bus, okay? So think about the things you do. Uh, sitting on the bus and getting off the bus. Have a quick think about those things. You do it all the time when you leave college, school. Uh, is it different when college and school compared to maybe when you get on the bus in town? That'd be interesting. Have a think. So hopefully these are some of the ideas that you thought about, okay? Uh, when you when we get on a bus, train, whatever, we're pretty good at queuing in this country. Queuing is a social norm. There is actually no law that says you must queue for a bus, but we do it anyway. And imagine if we didn't have the norm of queuing. Imagine the chaos. Um, it would. Uh, the reason we all managed to queue is because all those people in that line that you can see in this image, they probably haven't met each other before, many of them, and yet they all share the norm of queuing. And it allows society to kind of be stable and get along without everyone trying to murder each other trying to get on the bus. Nevertheless, norms are what we call situational and they can be different in different situations, which can often lead to problems. So for example, on the right, I've got an image there of a lady talking on her mobile phone. It is perfectly normal to talk on your mobile phone fairly loudly as you're walking along the street, in your home, in a pub even. However, it is not considered normal to speak loudly on your mobile phone on a bus or a train. It really annoys everyone. And you can see that lady to that lady on that lady's shoulder looking a bit annoyed. That's not really normal. Like I said before about values, um, norms can also be different in other cultures. And this can lead to significant misunderstandings, particularly if you go on holiday or we have people come from other countries to live in the UK. Sometimes they can misunderstand what's considered normal and the values that are shared by the dominant culture. And that can, can lead to conflict sometimes or misunderstandings. So when it comes to um, the norms guiding behaviour, particularly on buses, I want you to have a think about what can we do when people don't follow the norms on a bus? So for example, you've got um, an image there of a lady with a baby and a teenager sat down, uh, ignoring the lady carrying the baby. The norm would be for that young person to give up the seat so the young mum can sit down. That is normal. However, when people don't do that, what can we do as a society or what can we do as individuals to say you're sat on that bus and you know maybe across the way, what can you do to kind of change that person's behaviour? What can you do to make that person feel uncomfortable about the fact that they're clearly breaking the social norm? Because again, they're not breaking the law, but they are definitely breaking the norm for behaviour. So, like I said, that was a real quick tour through some of the quick, the main concepts in sociology. And now what I'd like you to do is to use everything you've learned in this lecture to explain to me how these images actually represent sociology. You can annotate these images or whatever you need to do. Okay, think about the links between the groups. What are they? Think about what the magnifying glass represents. Think about what those different groups represent. I'd like you to try and use these to explain what exactly is sociology. And maybe you could use that to explain what sociology is to some of your friends and family when you get time. Thanks for listening. Bye.